Uh, okay, sorry about that. I thought we might get through it without any hitches, but no, there we go. Um, so, okay, this is something that I'm going to try. I'm just, I was just saying when you couldn't hear me there about how it's really nice to see you lot chatting amongst yourselves long before this even went live. The chat was up and all afternoon people have been dipping in. I've been popping in and out just to have a look uh, and to see you guys talking amongst yourselves about some of this has been great to see. Uh, so thank you for coming back again. This is something that I'm going to experiment with tonight. Um, doing these Ask Elvis, my Monday Ask Elvis video, doing it in a live format. Uh, just because I thought it might work quite well. And even if we get racing, going racing again, I might continue to do it. So at the end of it, obviously, let me know if, uh, if you think this works. I'll let you know if I think it works from my end. And, uh, and if it does, maybe we'll continue to do this. What I've done, and the way I think it might work best, and again, this can all be tweaked as we move forward. I've picked, uh, I think, nine or ten questions um, that I've picked out already, pre-selected pre those from uh, those that you've been sending in on this platform and on social media as well. So I've got nine questions lined up. I'm going to use those as the basis, but we can spin off that in all directions depending on what you guys want to talk about. And obviously I want your input on all of these, the answers that I give. I'd love to know your thoughts on them as well. And when we've got through those questions, if we've still got time at the end, well, we'll open it up. We'll see where it goes. You guys can fire some questions in and, uh, and we'll see which direction it ends up going in. So, uh, volume up, somebody says. A uh, little bit, there we go. Um, right, thank you. Let's have a quick hello to everybody, because um, I do love that bit where everyone's shouting where they're coming from. Battleaxe26 from Cape Town. Um, big shout out to you guys over there. Uh, hi from Colorado. Uh, Ray Surgeon 3 d um, Who else have we got? Um, lots of people want to talk about Alonso already. Um, <laughs> um, where are you? Shout me out from wherever you are in the world. South End on Sea, Jazz Woodall. Thank you very much. Not a million miles away from where I am. Hi from Italy, uh, Fotis. Greetings, Mark, from Romania, says uh, Matt Adden in Tudor. Thank you very much. That's amazing. Uh, Netherlands, uh, Johan Jacobs, 1983. Um, right, I'm going to leave the volume on my, my settings as it is. So if it's too quiet, turn yours up and I promise I won't touch it again. Um, Newport, South Wales, Hungary, Malaysia, South Africa, Mexico, Ireland, the Netherlands, Scotland, Norway, Stratford-upon-Avon, Brussels. Amazing. Amazing. So nice to see you all uh, coming back uh, from literally all over the world. That is incredible. Um, thank you very much for all, all of you for joining. Uh, right, shall we get into it then? Um, now, again, this could go all wrong because I've teed up the questions. Hopefully I can put them on the screen. Uh, let me start by popping this one up which relates to the thumbnail there we go uh, marsikowski i hope i've pronounced that right uh, marsan says if you were cyril abitable what would you do alonso bottas maybe hulkenberg or somebody else and this is where i wanted to start it tonight talking about uh, the last major piece in this jigsaw puzzle that hasn't had a, a piece moved into place have they obviously their star man in danny ricardo has left opening up a gap alongside esteban ocon I asked you guys in a poll earlier on, which we'll come to in a moment, who you think, who you'd love to see take that seat. Not necessarily who you think will get it, but who you'd like to see get it. I'll show you the results of that uh, in a moment. Um, if I were Cyril Abitable, what would I do? Now, this is quite a big and open-ended question, and I'm, I'm sort of going to sit on the fence slightly in that their next driver decision, the guy who takes that vacant seat, that decision is all got to be based on Renault's long-term Formula One plans, hasn't it? And indeed, if they have any long-term Formula One plans, because there are so many factors, and I've talked about this on here before, so many factors pointing towards a Renault exit from F1, which may even just have been compounded with what's going on in the world right now and the financial impl implications to major auto manufacturers. If they have, if they're bored, are not convinced and are refusing to renew the budget for Renault and are refusing to sign the next Concord agreement. If they're looking at a short term fix, well, they could promote one of their young drivers from the academy, from the young driver program and give them a shot alongside Esteban Ocon. That's a, that seems like a fair thing to do. Seems like a fairly decent thing to do. I don't think anybody would question them too much about that. Esteban Ocon, highly regarded driver, say that they've put they would put everything behind him and a young driver could come along and, and learn the ropes, learn from him and back him up. The other side to this, of course, hoping to stay. And even if it's the team hoping still to convince the board at Renault that they should stay in Formula One, well, then maybe you need this big name signing. Now, 
there are a couple of big names available. Sebastian Vettel. First of all, let's talk about him. I can't see Sebastian Vettel going to a team like Renault. He's already talked about wanting a championship uh, and only wanting to continue when he has a, a chance of a championship. Renault's not going to give him that, certainly not in the short term. Of course, what happens beyond 2022 and the next set of, of regulations is slightly unknown. And there's as much chance that Renault could do a decent job with that as anybody else in that it's a resetting of the playing field and, and there's a lot for everybody to exploit the new set of regulations. Renault could end up doing an amazing job with that and could end up topping the tables in 2022 and beyond. Who knows? Nobody knows is the point though. So if you're trying to convince a driver at this stage that that's what you think you'll be able to do, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, particularly if your current track record is as disappointing as Renault's is. So I'm, I'm going to say Sebastian Vettel is unlikely to want to go to a team like Renault at this point. Then you could have a Hulkenberg. Hulkenberg sitting on the sidelines, dependable. They know him very, very well, of course. He could slot straight back in. It's a plug and play option. And he'd probably get you some fairly steady results alongside Esteban Ocon. It's not an exciting uh, prospect necessarily, is it? It's not a long term prospect for Renault. That would be one that would fill the gap until perhaps somebody else becomes available or they decide to leave the sport. And then, of course, there's the big elephant in the room. There's Fernando Alonso. And I will get to your comments on this in a moment uh, because there's been a lot about Alonso. Two ways to look at this. First of all, as I say, if, Fernand if Renault need to convince the Renault board um, that they should be continuing to invest, invest in their Formula One programme, well, Fernando Alonso is, the, is a poster boy to do that, isn't he? He's a guy who will bring a huge marketing attraction to the team. He will bring sponsors, um, you know, he will put the Renault name back on the map, even if only in a short term whilst the hyper... If you're Fernando Alonso, why do you want to come to Renault? Do you just desperately want to get back into Formula One and you've been sitting on the sidelines for a while now and you just desperately want to get in a Formula One car? Because if that's the case for Alonso, probably Renault's the only place he can go. You know, yeah, you could probably go somewhere further down the grid, but there are so many teams that don't want to take Fernando Alonso for various reasons. Renault, probably the last place that he could just still walk in because of his connections and his history. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a very real possibility. If Fernando Alonso wants to come back to Formula One, probably Renault is his option on that one. Uh, if you're Renault, I imagine you'd take him in a shot. You've saved a huge amount of money from the uh, departure of Daniel Ricciardo. You can then, of course, plough that straight into a Fernando Alonso if that's the way you want to go with it. So my thoughts are that. Lots of people saying young drivers, yep. Um, Jack, uh, too bad Jack Aitken left, says Rob Graham. Absolutely. BB King says Jensen Button. Um, uh, Christian Van Dyke says he's too old. Uh, I presume you mean Alonso. Uh, yeah, Alonso will be turning 40 next year, so he definitely is getting on a bit. Uh, let's look at the poll. Let me quickly uh, bring that up and show you what you guys said, because, uh, hold on, where is it? Uh, the poll says that um, 400 votes, I only put it up just uh, recently, um, but a split, pretty much an even split between Alonso and Hulkenberg. And don't forget, this is a poll that I was asking you to say, what, who would you like to get the seat, not who you think will get the seat. So currently at the moment, split between uh, Fernando Alonso and Nico Hulkenberg. Very, very interesting. I actually didn't think that. I thought with Bottas in there as an option, I honestly thought more of you would go uh, with Bottas. I thought he would be a very real option for a lot of people. Um, but a lot of people still want to see Alonso back in F1. So uh, there we go. Um, let's look at some of your comments on this one. Uh, Nigel Mansell says Summer Farm Estates. <laughs> um, maybe. Might still be available. You never know. Uh, Gasly. Now, that's another name. Pierre Gasly, another name that's been thrown around quite a bit. Uh, French driver, of course. Attractive in that sense to, uh, to Renault. Um, uh, didn't McLaren sign Alonso? Uh, why didn't McLaren sign Alonso? Um, I don't think they need to sign Alonso. I think they've done that. They've been there. I don't think... Uh, whilst they have a relationship still, and Zach Brown and Fernando Alonso still get on very well uh, from everything that I hear, I don't necessarily think that uh, Alonso is the right man to take McLaren on their journey back towards the top. McLaren absolutely have a long-term goal in Formula One, 
I don't think Alonso fits that. Daniel Ricciardo is much more attractive in that sense alongside Lando Norris. Uh, Bottas dropped by Mercedes and in at Renault, says Perrin Williams. Um, there is a very real possibility, and I'm going to talk a bit more about Bottas in a moment, that that could well happen, that Bottas gets dropped from Mercedes or is available to move to Renault. Decent option if you're Renault because he, as well as being a decent driver, he also brings a huge amount of knowledge from that Mercedes team that's very, very valuable to them. Uh, Grosjean, again, uh, I can see why. Not sure it's an exciting move or a long-term move. Um, let's see. Uh, I think the team's finished. They would have signed by now, says Nick9737. Um, interestingly, it did read from the press release, didn't it, from Renault, that they were the ones out of all of this that were slightly caught out by the fact that Daniel Ricciardo left. It wasn't a particularly, um, well, how can you say, it wasn't a particularly uh, nice statement that they put out. Um, it didn't seem to be hugely sympathetic. I don't think it even said a huge thank you to Daniel, if, any, Daniel, if anything at all. Uh, I, think, I feel like they've been caught out in this. Ferrari were well ahead of the game. McLaren were well ahead of the game. Talking to those two sets of drivers months in advance, it feels to me like Renault were the last ones to find out. Um, right, let's see. Uh, what other French drivers do they have in the young driver program or in F2? Well, does it have to be a French driver? They've got Ocon, of course. I can see there's a marketing attraction to having that, but I don't think you need to be check. You don't need to be checking the ticking the box of both drivers in that sense. It's more about getting the right driver, despite his nationality. I would have thought. Um, drop Bottas to Renault. Put George Russell in the Merc. Right. Let's move on then, because the next question. Uh, let's move over to my questions. Hopefully, if I do that and then that. Um, so we'll get on to Bottas and Russell in a moment. Uh, but F1 uh, AHM, uh, this one was from Twitter, I believe. He says, hi, Mark. Is F1 in real danger uh, this, uh, if this season doesn't start? If yes, doesn't that mean the sport is financially fragile inherently? And the answer to that is absolutely. Formula One is incredibly fragile, more so now than ever before. Um, partly because of the global crisis that we're all in the middle of right now and the financial knock-on effects that that's going to have running on. You know, we don't, know, we don't even know quite the impact that that's going to have on sponsors and on manufacturers and their commitment to the sport. But also we're right at the end of the current binding agreement that ties anybody to Formula One. At the end of 2020, as things stand, nobody is signed up to compete beyond this year in this sport. That's an incredibly precarious and fragile, as you said there, position for Formula One to be in, particularly as it comes at the same time as this global financial crash that's about to hit. Because if you're a Renault, if you're a, a manufacturer, even a Honda, even some of the others, even a Mercedes, if you're looking at your the global head of Mercedes is looking at where he's spending his money, what he's spending his money on, where he can cut back. You've got to start looking at Formula One as one of the first places you might decide to start cutting back on your marketing budget. Take Mercedes as an example. Mercedes have won everything. And since this new era of Formula One came in in 2014, they have ticked every single box. Whatever money they have put into their Formula One program has delivered an incredible return for them. They even quoted numbers recently, I forget what they were, but what, what financial um, return they have had on their investment through marketing value, through marketing dollars. It's an incredible investment. They've done all of that. If they're now at a point where they have to start looking at cutting things down, cutting things back, they could quit. They could literally walk away from the sport whilst they're on top. And it wouldn't be a huge surprise. Maybe they'll stay and they'll supply engines but, you know, the fact that our, our sport, to go back to your question, the fact that our sport is propped up by automotive manufacturers who not only supply teams, but then power the teams with all the engines across the grid. If one of those leaves, it takes away a huge chunk of what keeps our sport going. Not just the investment, not just the, the marketing and the brand awareness and all those things, but literally the engines that power the cars. So, yes, the answer to your question is that we are in a very fragile position um, I hope that the next set of regulations, together with a cost cap and all these different things that are happening now, will start to, to change all of that. 
Um, Still I Rise 4485 says, F1 will be fine. Liberty's finding ways to cut costs and make the sport more attractive globally. I'm from the US. This is how we get down. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I do think it will be fine. I think it's very fragile, but I do think it will be fine. I think the, the decisions that are being made now and the ones that were being put in place before this were really great, good, well thought out decisions. Things like the cost cap. Things like changing the way that uh, the governance is, is, uh, happens over Formula One. Being able to make decisions without unanimity from, uh, from all of the teams. Those are all really sensible decisions. And I think things like that uh, are all starting to fall into place, which will make the sport a much more attractive and hopefully much more stable enterprise altogether. Um, do Renault have any female drivers who, uh, who are ready for F1? My gut feeling says no. Jamie Ch Chadwick uh, still has years to go before she's ready to take a seat at F1. So slightly off topic there, Chris A. Um, but let's answer it anyway. I, I don't know, actually, that they have any female drivers on the programme. Certainly not that are close to the top. So I don't see that being an immediate option. Um, Jamie Chadwick, uh, of course, with Williams, probably the closest, I would say. Um, and next in line if, if she continues to develop. The problem is no one's racing any cars right now. So they can't show what they can do. They can't develop their skills. And everything's kind of on hold, which is unfortunate. Um, Henry Coppard, 10 teams is already quite low with one or two teams leaving or manufacturers quitting. It could be devastating. Car industry in crisis will make completely Henry. Henry, that is exactly my point there. I think um, we're propped up by an industry that's going to be heavily affected by the financial crash. Now, if they're affected, turn to Formula One to save money, as I say. Um, uh, my channel says, do you think McLaren's resurgence could be affected by the pandemic? Um, well, no more so, I think, than, than anybody else necessarily. Everybody is in the same boat in that they're going to be hit hard financially. McLaren are in a pretty decent situation. I know that they have been looking to government funding and you may have seen a story recently. They were turned down from a, for a government grant. Uh, they're looking at other ways to, to fund and to fill the gap. But everybody's having to do that. That doesn't necessarily say, say that McLaren's in an even worse position than anybody else. They are funded, ultimately, they are owned by a very wealthy group. And if it really came to it, there may well be funds that could be injected in to, to keep them afloat. So I don't worry about McLaren as, a, as much as I would worry about some of the others. Um, and will it hamper their long-term goals? I don't think so. I think they're still building in the right direction. Brand new wind tunnel being built right now. New driver lineup, which is, a, which is exciting, which is aggressive, which sounds and looks like it's a team chasing for the top, striving for success. So really high hopes for McLaren over the next few years. And don't forget, of course, as I said before, 2022, huge opportunity for everybody. So putting these pieces into place right now will put them all, will put them in the best position possible when it comes to doing that. Um, right, uh, Jim Pick says Bernie Eccleston must be laughing himself to sleep. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't think he will. You know, I think Bernie loves Formula One. I don't think he would enjoy seeing Formula One suffer. My feeling is that I don't think the Formula One will suffer. I actually think Formula One will come out of this better than it went in, as long as the teams survive, the manufacturers survive, and racing survives, which I'm sure it will. I think we could come out of this with a better more equal, more stable, more fair Formula One than we had before we, uh, we started on all this. Uh, right, let me move on to the next question, uh, hopefully. So, get rid of that one. The next one from Jonathan Stout says, here's the Russell question, I've got them in the wrong order. Jonathan Stout, what do you think Russell has to do to make, uh, to make his, to make the way into, hang on, <laughs> what do you think Russell has to do to make his way into Bottas's Merck seat? Um, would he be able to extrapolate? Would they be able to extrapolate his Williams performances? I can't read. <laughs> um, could they take uh, his Williams, extrapolate his Williams performances in a meaningful way? There we go. Um, thank you. Got through that eventually. So good question, Jonathan. Um, Russell is doing everything he can to get into that Mercedes seat. He was in the terrible, terrible car last year, but all he could do was beat his teammate on every single level. And he did that, apart from the point, of course. If you look at the table, it will show uh, Kubica as, as ahead of him. But as we know from following the season, he outscored him, he outperformed him, didn't outscore him, he outperformed him on every single weekend. And I think that was the important thing. That's what he had to do. Um, Williams and Mercedes, of course, have a very close relationship. So they will, of course, talk to each other about George Russell. And don't forget, as I mentioned recently, Mercedes 
have some of their own personnel in the Williams garage operating the Mercedes power unit at Williams, working with Williams all season long, working with the drivers. So they have a very real line of contact into that Williams team and a direct line of contact, a contact to the drivers. So they'll get a huge amount of information. They will have access to some of that data, of course, through their engine guys, their power unit guys. And I think the relationship between those two teams is open enough that they will openly discuss that kind of thing. It's no secret that George Russell is a Mercedes driver. And at some stage, if he continues on the path he's on, they will probably want him back. Now, this is where I was going to talk about Bottas. Bottas currently on a sort of rolling contract, isn't he? So we'll all be frozen from where we last picked up, which was probably pre-season testing. And in that situation, you only get an impression of your own driver, not those at other teams. So it's a difficult time for any driver to be pushing your seat anywhere or pushing for a stake to claim the seat they're in right now. My own feeling is that George Russell will be moving up to the Mercedes main team alongside Lewis Hamilton for the perhaps the remainder of his contract to learn the ropes from him to perhaps you know take up that position as a number two driver although he won't be called that alongside Lewis with a view if Mercedes do have a long-term plan for Formula One to taking over that mantle that role as the lead driver perhaps when Lewis eventually steps away from the sport that would be my gut feeling on this and if that is the case as I said that could free Bottas up to potentially move to somewhere like Renault, where he could be quite an attractive proposition for them. Let's see what people say on this one. Um, uh, why do Merck have Bottas, uh, Alex Maple? Alec Maple. Well, M Bottas has done a decent job for Mercedes. Let's not forget, with the driver lineup they've got, they have won everything over the last few years. So you can't knock it too much. Um, you know, it's worked out well. The dynamic between the two is kind of OK, isn't it? They've not fallen out to a degree that Bot uh, that uh, Rosberg and Hamilton did or Alonso and Hamilton did with us. So the dynamic has worked out. The performances have been a, a little bit up and down with Bottas. But as a team, they've had a car that's been so dominant, he's been able to pick up the, the places and the championship, which, of course, is the important thing. Um... How fast is George Russell? Haven't seen him come through the junior categories and we can't decide much from this season at Williams, but is he good? Love the channel, mate. Thank you very much from Kieran Deneen. Um, well, he was very good. George was very good in the junior categories. Um, won the Formula 2 championship, didn't he? Uh, which was what got him the promotion up to Williams eventually. Um, so, yeah, he's been good. He's been very quick. Uh, he's always been one of the taller drivers. Uh, which has hampered him at, at times, perhaps in, in, you know, karting as such. But he managed to, to come through that and, and come through the junior categories very successfully. Uh, he's always been on the radar of some very important people in Formula One. And that's exactly why Mercedes picked him up. So I think Mercedes have seen something pretty special in, in, in George. I think Williams, every time you hear anybody from Williams talking about George Russell, it's in the very highest regard. So I don't think we need to worry too much about George Russell's credentials. He's doing what he, he did, what he needed to do last year. And yes, it was in a terrible car, but he can only work with the tools he's got. Don't forget, of course, Mercedes have had him in the main Mercedes car in testing. So they have had first hand experience. He'll have worked on the simulator with them. They're not just letting him go to Williams and not seeing him again for, for another season. They're in constant contact, constantly working with each other and they will be building up their own picture. Um, Russell, his way to F1 was as good as on his way to F1 was as good as Leclerc, says uh, Simon uh, Mrozek. Mrozek. Um, so yeah, Russell was as good as Leclerc. Yeah, he was in that category. He was in that bunch, wasn't he? Um, a really strong young driver lineup that have all come through the junior categories together and are now in Formula One. Under Formula One, pretty exciting, uh, I would say. Uh, George goes to racing PowerPoint, says Gust. <laughs> you must have seen the memes floating around. And by the way, if you've seen Alonso, just while we're quickly on that subject, Alonso, I don't know if he's winding everybody up or whether it's already a done deal, but already starting to tweet an Instagram about, in fact, I think it might have his Instagram post here. Uh, look at that. From Fernando Alonso recently, he started to do a few things like this, posting pictures of himself in the, uh, in the Renault or in Formula One. Um, is he playing with people or is he genuinely about to announce something big? Um, interesting. Right, let's move on. Next question. Uh, the next question comes from 
Steve Cole, 1984. Uh, this one I picked from the chat that was happening on here earlier on, um, before we went live. Uh, Steve Cole, 1984. Do you think Ferrari's underestimating Carlos Sainz that he'll be satisfied with being a second driver? I believe Carlos can win races and will put Charles under pressure. Um, Steve, I totally agree with you. I don't necessarily think they've underestimated, underestimated him. I don't think Ferrari will have taken him as a number two driver. And I don't even think that Carlos would have gone there willingly as a number two driver. Um, I do think that he can win races. I do think that he can challenge uh, Charles on occasion. And I don't think it's going to be the case that Charles will get preferential treatment and Carlos will be you know, destined to be a number two. I think they will let the performances determine how the, how the team dynamic operates. And that then becomes up to Carlos to prove his worth. So I'm totally with you. I do think he can uh, put up a good fight. He can be a great driver for Ferrari. I wouldn't say that they underestimated uh, take him on, taking him on. Aerospacenews.com says Carlos won't settle for number two. Totally agree with you. I don't think he will. Um, I see Alonso doing a Friday test with Renault, says Rock111. Uh, will he do a Friday test? Why would he do a Friday test? I mean, surely he wouldn't want to just come and dip his toe in the water of Formula One with Renault. He's got an opportunity, if he wants it, to come back and race Formula One cars again. I get the impression he does want to do that. And as I said before, I think Renault could be his only option to do it with. Uh, Carlos was good in Toro Rosso against Max. Absolutely. Perrin Williams. Absolutely he was. Uh, he's, done him, he's had a good career, Carlos. Been under the radar. But when you now go back and analyse what he's been able to do in, you know, in such a, a relatively short space of time as a young driver, he's been pretty impressive. So uh, I think they've made a good move. Uh, will Max leave Red Bull for a higher team, says Harry Cowan. Um, well, he's just signed a new long-term contract, hasn't he, till 2024, I think I'm right in saying. Uh, so I don't think he's going to go anywhere soon because that contract will have, first of all, paid him a huge amount of money. But the clauses to get him out of that, unless they are performance related, and of course that could happen further down the line, um, will be so expensive. I can't see anybody coming in to swipe Max away from Red Bull in the short term. Um, XR Bukowski, if Alonso joins Renault, Ocon's career will go even more downhill. Right, that's a fair point, isn't it? Um, the, the, the other side to Alonso, whilst he brings you know, a bit of, uh, of glitz and glamour and a bit more, a bit of Hollywood back to a team that might be struggling. Renault is the dynamic that he then places upon the team, as we've seen so often, could be difficult. And they've got a good driver in Ocon who's, who needs the right environment to thrive. He's been out on the sidelines for a while. He needs an opportunity to shine. If Alonso did come back in and sort of wrestled power within the team, that could be a real nail in the coffin for, for Ocon. So I, I kind of agree with you. Really good point. Um, let's see. Uh, surely Alonso isn't interested in 2021, but 2022 when the new red cars come in. Uh, that comes from Abina Erharin. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's right. I think every driver is going to be really curious to see these 2022 cars. But are they going to want to come back? Would Alonso want to come, come back after so much time away straight into a new set of regs? I think he's going to want to be part of that process. And if it's with Renault, get his foot back in the water of Formula One, but also be part of that development process for the 2022 car. If he's got longer term visions of trying to excel in Formula One again, maybe trying to get a championship under the new regulations, he's going to need to get back in now, not just turn up in 2022 and hope it goes well. Uh, right, let me move on. Next question. Uh, thanks so much as well, guys. Everything that's happening in the chat, I really appreciate it. Obviously, I can't get through them all, but I do appreciate you... Uh, you having so much input. Uh, the next one from Geordie 139 says, when's the last time a driver knew they were heading to a new team the following season before the current season had even started? Now, I saw this one earlier, and um, I mean, let me know what you think on this, because the one that jumped to mind for me was Alonso. It was Alonso coming to us at McLaren. Now, he came for the 2007 season, but the deal was done in 2005. So he had a whole season, didn't he, in 06 at Renault, uh, in which he won the championship. But all the way through that season, he knew he was coming to McLaren. We knew he was coming to McLaren. So uh, I think that might be the last time. But if you can think of anybody else, uh, let me know. When was the last time a driver did an entire season with one team, knowing that they were going to another team afterwards? 
Uh, Kimmy Two Ferrari says Perrin Williams. Um, don't know. Not sure. I can't actually remember on that one. Uh, do you mean first time around or second time around? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, 1,100 mates here. Top job, guys, says Rock111. Uh, brilliant. That's amazing. Um, thank you. It's, it, and it does feel like mates, doesn't it? We've built an amazing little community here. Thank you very much. Uh, nobody else seems to. There you go. Uh, no one else can, I think, can think of a uh, Kimi Raikkonen again. So maybe Kimi did a, a whole season knowing he was going to Ferrari. I actually can't remember. But a lot of you saying that, Alec Maple as well. Uh, so I will, um, I'll bow down to you on that one. I can't remember, I don't know. Um, right, that was a good one though. Let's move on. Next question comes from Club Carbon, who says, <laughs> will someone turn Carlos blue? <laughs> um, mate, I hope so. <laughs> I will put my trust in my former colleagues at McLaren. If you've got no idea what we're talking about, this refers to the fact that there's a tradition at McLaren that when somebody leaves, whether it's a mechanic or an engineer uh, or occasionally a driver, <laughs> um, they get dyed blue with this really intense blue powder. Um, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, check out my Tales from the Treehouse. Uh, there's a funny story there about when Kimmy left. But yeah, I hope somebody takes it to, uh, to um, Carlos. He's got a really good relationship within the team. The boys love him. Um, I suspect as long as we get racing again, they will give him a pretty decent send off. And I wouldn't know who's all over the, uh, the, the blue dye making sure that happens. So, yeah, really good one. <laughs> um, uh, right, let's, let's uh, yeah, lots of people saying Williams. Um, absolutely then. So, uh, sorry, lots of people saying Kimmy was the, the other driver to, um, uh, to sign a contract a year before going there. Um, I have a feeling that Lando will make Carlos blue, says Christopher Rulli. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, <laughs> Uh, right, let's um, let's leave that one. Mark, you wasn't dyed blue, right? No, I didn't get dyed blue when I left, because what seems obvious to me is you don't tell people, you don't tell your mates you're leaving, you don't go to the last race saying, right, this is my last race, guys, I want a big send-off. I kept it quiet until the end of the season, and then I went and made the announcement where we had no more races. So it seems so sensible to me, and yet everyone gets it wrong. <laughs> Uh, right, let's move on. Next question. Uh, how many more have I got? A couple more to go. Uh, get rid of that one. Mario Positano says, Hey Mark, love your show. A rule exists that limits the flex of any parts. Do you know where this rule came from and why this technology is not allowed to progress? Um, that's a good question. So mostly I guess we're talking about flexible wings, uh, flexible bodywork. Um, it's always been there. So flexible aerodynamics have always been a thing. Um, and partly that's because you have to have some flex, otherwise things would break much more easily. Every time you hit a curb or a bump uh, and under huge loading, they would be fragile and break. So we have to have some amount of flex, which is why you can't put a rule that says zero flexing allowed. Having said that, I remember back in about 1999, so just before I started in Formula 1 in 2000, there was a big sort of Ferrari about flexible wings at that point. And there were much more strict rules being brought in at that time, around 2000, uh, as I say, when I first started, to limit the amount of flex available uh, or that, that was allowed. And over time, that's been the reason that that rule is there is because there were so many failures. People were experimenting with flexible wing structures to try and reduce drag at high speed as the load piles onto the wing. It flexes and, and tips back and, and flattens the profile and therefore reduces drag, increases top speed. That's exactly what you'd do if you had an open canvas in the rules. You design a wing that could shape shift around the lap for when you want downforce and when you don't. So that's what the flexible wings are all about. They've been very clever about how they do it in really clever, intricate layups in the carbon, uh, entwining the fibres in certain ways, in certain directions, even laying up other materials in the carbon like rubber, creating particularly spring sections on certain parts. So there's a lot of work and detail goes into this kind of thing, but the FIA have had to step in because once you start flexing wings and pushing those boundaries to the limit, which teams will always do, they can end up with failures. So that's the reason that the, the restrictions are in. That's why people are not allowed to just go wild with flexible stuff. Personally, I do think that if we were able to do something like that and, and allow it to certain extents, 
The teams, like with everything, have to be responsible for the safety of their car. But once you give them an inch, they will take a mile. And that's why the FIA have had to step in. The other thing, of course, is if you allow it, everybody has a flexible wing or flexible bodywork or flexible floors or whatever. And everyone, then the advantage that's gained, it, it's all everybody has. And yet the danger element potentially is still there. So that's why, uh, and that's why it was changed. Let me move on to the next question. Comes... Uh, Jamie Hutchins, this one, and he says, uh, with all the remote connections to an F1 car, would it in theory be possible for a team to hack uh, a rival's car? It could gain a huge advantage if you knew all the data from a rival's car while it's on track. Do the teams consider this and what's in place to prevent it? Absolutely, they consider this. Uh, it's a really, really important part of every team's infrastructure. Uh, the idea of... Um, sending data both uh, from the pits wirelessly which of course they do so that network has to be incredibly secure the data has to be encrypted and that's why you've got every team now partnered with a cyber security uh, firm for that exact reason to be able to encrypt data in the most advanced way but also to send it wirelessly from the car to the pits but also of course now from the pits back across the world to their factories instantaneously and that has to be done very quickly, it has to be done very securely. There are other issues like having to back up your data because the whole operation now runs and relies so heavily on data and, uh, and all of those sensors and all the information coming from that. That if you have a, you know, a, a wireless transmission go down, for example, or if you get breached, your system is breached and you get a virus and it's corrupted, you have to have other ways to be able to operate. So you have to have backups that you can refer to quickly uh, and this is obviously the same for most big companies but of course in Formula One it's all happening very quickly in real time over in some pretty harsh environments at times uh, a car that's doing 200 miles an hour bouncing around curbs and everything else and yet it has to be as reliable as any other system on the planet and as secure so the answer is uh, you've always had situations where teams have, have tried to hack into this kind of stuff it was always a big thing and, and actually even radio transmissions. I mean, you'll, people who've read my book will know we had a, not a department, but an area within a department set up to try and, and hack the radio transmissions of every other team, as every other team was trying to do to us. And now we're using military grade encryption systems to, to encrypt the radio for all that very same reason. So radio traffic and car data and garage data, data coming to and from the factory is very important to a team, critical in fact, and therefore has to be protected because if it did fall into the wrong hands it can be incredibly valuable to them and costly to you so good question thanks very much Jamie um, let's see uh, what you lot have got um, what exactly caused the suspension failure on Sebastian Buemi's Toro Rosso in China just a poorly designed part or was it caused by damage obtained by rough driving on earlier laps from Chris A <laughs> Chris A you're going well off topic here aren't you but I like it that's fine um, I think are you talking about the one where both wheels came off because if you are I actually covered this in a video recently and uh, it was an upright failure and when one upright failed the load that, that suddenly was transmitted to the other side because one side had collapsed was, was greater than it could cope with and the other one broke almost instantaneously. So upright failure was the reason there. Um, H3, one, H311 Dream, I think that is. How does the pit stop crew add more or less wing during a pit stop? Um, very quickly using a, essentially like a battery drill. That's the same, that's the kind of equipment. Uh, there's a, a little piece, like you put a piece on the end of a battery drill, there's a, a receptacle on the front wing which has a big lead in so that it's very easy to find. You can just jam it in there. The gun is preset to go one turn more or one turn less or half a turn more, whatever it is you want. You preset that, jam the gun in, pull the trigger, and it does its job very quickly and you pull the gun out. So it's a very simple operation, but it's been designed in the same way everything is with the most meticulous preparation to be able to do it quickly uh, and easily. Um, right, let me see, what else have we got? Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, well, just quickly, Josh Smith, I feel that's just extremely unsporting to hack another team's data. Uh, Josh, it is unsporting, but <laughs> that's Formula One. When has Formula One ever been sporting? Um, I mean, I agree with you. 
But that's how it, things, teams will look for any advantage, no matter what it is. And ultimately, there's actually no rule in the sporting regulations that says you're not allowed to scan other people's radio transmissions. Um, so you're not breaking any rules in that sense. Um, perhaps there should be, <laughs> but I don't think there is. And, um, and so if there's an advantage to be had in any means possible, they will try and do it. It's just like they all commission photographers to go and camp out outside other teams' garages and try and get the photograph that, that you want to see. Um, there's a whole espionage uh, operation going on at every team. Thermal Im imaging camera uh, cameras looking up from the balcony above people's pit stop areas, trying to scan down the, the tyre surface temperatures of rival teams' tyres to build a picture of what everyone's doing up and down the pit lane. All sorts of stuff like that goes on because if you can you know, glean an advantage from it, then you will. Uh, right, next question. Let's go to, this is the last question that I've got from Nathan Murray, who says, holding two GPs in a row, how do you see the second week's race happening after all the experience and data collected on the first week? More interesting or more boring? <laughs> well, if you run the same race with the same format and the same teams and drivers on the same tyres, you can pretty much more or less expect the same result, can't you? Um, because everybody's gleaned all that information. Everybody knows exactly what to, to expect. They're all better prepared than they were first time around. And therefore, you're likely to get a very similar result. Um, I would love to see them change up the format for the second race weekend. And I don't think I've seen a definitive uh, message from Formula One yet on exactly how this is going to work. But we could do things with different tyre availability if there are enough tyres. We could do anything as extreme as a reverse grid race. I don't think that's going to happen now. But um, this is an opportunity to try something a little bit different on the second weekend. Otherwise... I think we could end up with something that's maybe not boring because Formula One, I don't think, is rarely, it's rarely ever boring. But I think the result will be very similar to the one we had a week before. What do you think on that one? Um, have you heard that Channel 4 can only broadcast one of the two races when it's a double header from Will Bennett? So in the UK... Um, yeah, I think that's still being discussed, if I'm honest. Uh, current contracts, of course, with, with uh, Channel 4 in the UK, they're the only, they only have one live race uh, from memory. I think it's, it was Silverstone, wasn't it? They were allowed to show the Silverstone Grand Prix live, and everything else here in the UK is behind a paywall with Sky. Um, there are still, as far as I know, still talks, still at this point, going on to see if we can relax some of those contracted rules given the unprecedented circumstances. Um, but I have no idea what stage they're at or what the outcome might be. Of course, what everybody wants is for as many eyeballs on Formula One as possible, particularly given that this is going to be a weird season compressed into the second half of the year. It feels like with no fans at the circuit, we should be getting as many viewers on TV as possible. As I said, those conversations are happening, uh, but I don't think we've reached a conclusion yet. Uh, do you think we could have big gaps between the compounds of tyres, such as C1 to 3 to 5 uh, on each race? We could, uh, and that may well help doing things like that, making a bit of variation in tyres, perhaps having different ones at different races. The problem is that uh, Pirelli are up against it in terms of production, because they are in the same situation. They've been in lockdown in Italy, uh, maybe just getting back to work now. Um, and, uh, and their factories around the world as well in Turkey and other places also been uh, heavily compromised so in terms of what they've been able to produce they're massively limited um, so I think uh, a large part of what they're able to do with tyres will depend on supply uh, and that's again something that um, will depend on uh, on exactly where we go which races we have because that's calendar still not set in stone and which tyres are needed for each of those races right let's take a couple more questions Partly because my laptop's going to run out of battery soon <laughs> and I've left the charger in the other room. <laughs> that was amateur of me, sorry. Um, let's take a couple more questions from you lot then because I've run out. I only picked uh, nine or ten uh, earlier on, but let's see what you guys are talking about here. Um, Mark, why most of the F1 teams have all the factories around the same area in the UK from Anderson, Amorium to Silver? Um, very interesting. Uh, it originally stemmed from the fact that that's where the hub of motorsport engineering was 
sort of around Silverstone area, that uh, motorsport valley. And a lot of the teams used subcontractors for a lot of the engineering back then. So with a lot of skilled people in that area, they all congregated because there was a supply chain in that area. Today, it's not quite as necessary. Most teams produce almost everything in-house. So actually, we could have moved, we could be moving anywhere, but actually just through tradi tradition, they're all sort of still based there. Um, let me see. Uh, Mark, hi Mark, do you think Seb is going to be motivated more than ever to prove a point uh, and also ignore team orders from Neil to Pugs? Uh, that's this season, for the remainder of this season. Will he, re I don't think he will, you know, I don't think he will uh, ignore team orders. Um, whether they get team orders will largely depend on performance. Um, they're not going to suddenly make him a number two driver at this point. It will depend on performance. And if he can outscore and outperform Charles Leclerc, well, he won't need to, to be ignoring team orders. Um, and I think if he is going to retire, he will want to retire with his head held high, not like a, a spiteful child, uh, which is how I guess that would seem. Uh, so no, I don't think Seb, although we've seen incidences where Seb has lost the plot and gone crazy, uh, have been spiteful and a bit childish at times, I don't think that's what we'll see for the remainder of this season. Um, right, we're on 10% of battery on the laptop, so let's get one more question in and then we'll say goodnight for this evening. Uh, let's see, who have we got? Which one job did you wish you could have had in F1 but never got to do, driving excluded, from Stephen Walters? Uh, thanks Stephen, good one to end it on. Mm. Do you know what? I love the job that I had. Genuinely, it was always a dream job. It's the job that I set out from when I was a kid to try and achieve, was being part of a Formula 1 pit stop and a mechanic in Formula 1, and I achieved that. Um, which other job? When I was in that role, I always kind of kind of wanted to do something um, that was a little bit easier because <laughs> it was pretty hard work. So I always used to look at, at the media and the marketing side and think, that would be quite nice you know, at times, just to spend a Monaco Grand Prix on a yacht. Uh, with all the guests. Maybe that would be quite nice. Uh, never got to do that. Um, I mean, luckily, I have actually spent a Monaco Grand Prix on a yacht since leaving, so that's another dream ticked. Um, so, yeah, no other real jobs that I strived for particularly because I had my dream job. And even till the last day on that job, I genuinely loved it. Uh, really, really did. Um, right, I better leave it there. Um, thank you so much to all of you uh, for taking part tonight. Uh, sorry about the slight technical, technical hitch with the mic. I hope the sound was okay in the end. I will fix that. One day we'll get this perfect. It's going to be amazing when that happens. I'm going to celebrate to myself. Um, but listen, really thank you for joining. Thanks for your... Because this chat is amazing. I love it. And I loved, as I said, loved watching you all get involved before we even went live. If you think this works really well, I'll definitely do it again next Monday. And we'll just keep going and, and see how we go. For me, it's, it's a nice way to do this. Questions coming in on the fly is exactly what I wanted this to all be about. It's about interacting with you whilst we go through the videos. So thank you very much. Uh, Alec Maple said, why did you leave? Just quickly then, I left because I'd been in Formula 1 for 10 years. I've been at McLaren for 10 years. We just won the title with Lewis Hamilton. And what it does to you of 10 years of travelling, particularly back then, is it takes an incredible amount out of you. Uh, sacrifice, personal sacrifice from you and from your family. And I felt at that point, particularly I had two young kids, uh, it was becoming harder and harder to see them. My two older kids who were with my ex-wife, that was becoming really difficult to have enough time to spend with family. And that's often the way, the reason lots of people leave. Family becomes, has to become the priority over what was a dream job for me in the beginning when I was young. So that was it. It felt like the right moment having just won. But it was, um, it was a really difficult and tough decision. Uh, to give up your dream job is very, very hard. Anyway, there we go. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave it there because the battery is about to die. <laughs> and I'll see you all very soon. By the way, video tomorrow coming from the, uh, when I was talking about the Codemasters interview I did last week. Really interesting stuff. If you're into F1 gaming and sim racing, check that out. I've still got to edit it, but I'm hoping that'll be ready tomorrow. With a little teaser. Here you go. I'll leave you with this one. A little teaser. There is still a chance that in F1 2020, we could still get DAS on the Mercedes. How about that? I'll leave that with you. Probably uh, uh, creates more questions than I can answer right now. But watch tomorrow's video on the channel, and I'll see you soon. Ta-da! See you, folks.